It's like, you know what they say, like if you, you can't work with a kid or with a chimpanzee, you know, no matter how great you are, you're working with Bobby Silverman in a scene. You might as well just say, you know, adios amigo. Because you can't. He's just too good. He enhanced the scene to a point where uh, it was just, I was in awe. I'd be in awe. I'd watch it and I'd just go, well, why don't you just, you know, take me out of the Screen Actors Guild because I don't belong in the same business as this guy. You don't know where he is, what he is. You don't know... You can't place him. And, in fact, I remember a film in which he didn't appear at all in, uh, uh, which was uh, almost the... I don't know, the strongest thing I have ever seen him do. Bobby Silverman was just like every other kid growing up on the south shore of Long Island. But then he made his acting debut in an elementary school production of Pierre Gint, and his performance sent shockwaves up and down the East Coast. Ironically, Bobby was already doing Ibsen in the fifth grade. Like every other kid in fifth grade, I was reading, you know, Weekly Reader, among other things, you know. And they had, I think they had a, either a pig or a duck review best plays in elementary school. And uh, Bobby was in Pier Gint. He played King of the Trolls. It was just, they actually have for the first time a layout of him, of, a, of, a, of an elementary school kid. Usually they just do a review. The duck would, would do the review of the best play. But because Bobby was so incredibly extra, extraordinary in this piece, they actually had like a photo journalistic piece that, with the duck it, behind a typewriter, you know, it looked like Abe Burroughs. It was wild, you know? And they just said that this was like the greatest performance by any elementary school kid ever. Bobby skyrocketed to leads in high school musicals, which catapulted him to his triumphant television debut. I saw Bobby Silverman, the first time I saw him was on a Kraft Music Hall special. I remember he was, it was, a, it was with Tony Randall. I think Tony Randall was in it. And, uh, uh, Bobby was, uh, as I recall, it was very distinct, and it really jumped out at me. But he was he was smoking a cigar, as I as I recall, and um, I looked at that and I said, I have to have him, I have to have him. Uh, I was about to do a uh, a TV movie for for ABC, and there was a scene in that movie that I thought he'd be perfect for, and uh, it, it was just the right face, the feeling, the look, the whole gestalt of the guy that uh, that really jumped out at me. I'm clean a dirty toilet bowl. I'm sorry. I meant doing a disagreeable household chore. Give me a new slate on camera, too. Please. Cue, Maddie. Cut, please. That little look, the little thing where he put his head in his hands, and I thought to myself, what is he doing? He's got the little bit, and yet he's covering his face like that. But what I didn't realize is that it was understatement to the nth degree, and it was so brilliant. And the whole scene came alive. Ultimately, the film worked. As a result of that film, I was able to start a, a career as a producer and a director. And, well, you know, the rest is history. I mean, so I would trace, you know, a, certainly a great deal of my success back to that one little moment. It's interesting that, um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to... to uh get going in Hollywood because of George Siegel uh, dropping out of a part for 10. And curiously enough, he's in this, this film with uh, Bobby Silverman. And, uh, and the interesting thing is, although the man would normally be sweated down a bit, you know, by makeup, uh, because he's in a, a threatened situation, there he is with his hands up and there's not, an in, there's not a bead of sweat on him. That is amazing. What can you say? He sucked the energy out of that out of those two superstars and you're just like focused like a flash of light like there he was in the middle I mean you, I don't care who was bookending him I mean at this point see going fonder but it was Silverman saying there is only one close-up of Silverman when uh, I've forgotten exactly what he says it, it, he's something mm -hmm. but the way he says mm -hmm. I, I mean it's 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 pathetic if I if I even try and uh, do it but the way he did that I think it was a very clear signal to, to Fonda and Siegel that 
They were both in trouble, that, you know, the Oscar was uh, up for grabs. There was a point in his career, right after Dick and Jane, where the offers were phenomenal. I mean, uh, Ed McMahon, as you know, was in that movie, and Ed wanted him to, to co-host The Tonight Show, and he passed because it would have given him too much exposure, and he wanted to maintain that fine line of, you know, I've worked in the business just a little bit, just to get the image out there, just that subliminal thing, just to keep it on the record that Bobby Silverman was here. The, the first time I ever, I ever met Bobby Silverman was in a TV movie I did called Portrait of an Escort. And um, it was really amazing. I knew right away, first of all, the first thing I knew when I saw Bobby Silverman was that this was a man. I mean, this was a man prepared to play the part of a man. We took a taxi cab ride together at the beginning of the show. And when I got in the taxi cab with Bobby Silverman, I knew it was a taxi cab. He taught me what it means to be an actor. Not to do shtick, but to be an actor. To create a character for my soul, not just to do a voice. Anybody can do a funny voice. Uh, you know, we were doing my autobiography, and they needed somebody to perform the, you know, the local flavor of the, of the old neighborhood in New York City. And I said, listen, if you're going to do this, you got to do it right. Bobby Silverman is our man. we got to have him. We just had to have him. And uh, it was great. It's a fantastic scene. you got to see it. But there goes Silverman. There he goes, walking in the rain, he doesn't look back. And we've all seen Gene Kelly uh, in Singing in the Rain. This man is walking in the rain. That is, uh, <laughs> it's always appalling, really, because it is so good. Well, Blue Sunshine, I think, is, he's a genius. OK, everybody, let's get together for a group shot. That miraculous entrance of his, suddenly he's, he's there on the screen, you know, and, uh, he sings a cappella for these, these people. He doesn't know these people. And yet he snaps his fingers in front of these people. Just in time. Snapping of the fingers, the singing of this song. And what is the song? Just, just in time. time. That's what Before Silverman's all about. He came here just in time. He came to save us in, in, the, act of, uh, in, in the act of acting, in the field of acting. And then that moment where, after he sung, and this person goes up to him and snatches his hair off his head. I mean, that was a brilliant moment because not only are his fingers nude, but his, his head is nude. He has a nude head with a little bit of hair here, a little bit of hair there, hair in there. And, um, and then there's that, that, that close-up of his eyes, something that has, has remained with me f for many years. To have Silverman on the screen giving that close-up. Uh, there was something, you know, the, the act of nude, nude head and the, the, that, that sort of the, the castration symbol of the eyes it's moving. I mean, you know, you're not going to castrate me sort of thing. And then he's off and out, running out again with his back to the screen. That's the last we saw him. Just like the, the, uh, the thing in New York, back to the screen. But when they rip off his head, his hair, he has a little ponytail. And the Christians ripped him. Completely. He's been ripped off more than any performer in our time. This last scene, uh, this death scene, uh, I think uh, a lot of things happen, a lot of truths are, are uh, etched out. It's very difficult to convince an audience that you're dead. But I think Sil Silverman uh, convinces us both that he is dead and that he is not dead. The same way as, you know, a child with that same measure of uh, grief uh, about the fantasy of, of killing the mother, for instance. Good, she's dead, and then good, she's alive. And of course, but we're horrified at both notions. And, and Silverman knows this. He knows deep in his psyche that that is, that is how we all feel. And he, uh, he plays that to the hilt. Uh, or to the Hilton, I can't remember. Uh, he etches each character so finely and so brilliantly. They're like little miniatures, you know, where you look at the detail work and it's so fine that Bobby gets lost. It's almost like the character takes over and where's Bobby? I don't know. 
He's just not, uh, he's beyond a normal human being. I mean, some people think that Einstein was an alien or that any great people are, but basically we're all linked somehow, but he, he's plugged in to infinity. He's the only actor I have ever known who doesn't bug the business affairs departments and studios. And then they just, all right, give him what he wants. And they never say that in Hollywood. They always say, let's get the best talent for the least amount of money. With Silverman, give him what he wants. There was Monty Cliff. There was Marlon Brando, Robert De Niro, and Bobby Silverman. Is Robert Silverman an actor? Is he not? We don't know. Is he dead? Is he not? In that one moment, he personifies that, that strange uh, ambivalence that we should be left with, that ambiguity of existence. Uh, Hegel expressed it very succinctly, but I can't remember how. But uh, Silverman uh, is not an enigma in a sense. He is and he isn't, and that's the enigma.